Greetings from ATSU AHEC program office from the Missouri campus. My name is Debbie Blessing and I will be your moderator for today's lecture. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the 16th annual Michael A. Creedon Memorial Lecture on Aging. Today's lecture is made possible by the Department of Interprofessional Education and Collaboration under the direction of Barbara Maxwell. Dr. Maxwell and Dr. Janet Head, the Missouri IPEC Campus Director, and Dr. Elton Borgnave, the Arizona Campus Director for the Center for Resilience and Aging, send their greetings and well wishes. So now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Marla Bergweger is a professor at St. Louis University School of Social Work and Executive Director for St. Louis University School of Medicine Geriatric Education Center. She earned her social work degrees at Kansas State University, University of Kansas, and Washington University. Her primary areas of research include family caregiving, cognitive stimulation therapy, social isolation, and loneliness. So without further ado, Dr. Bergweger, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you can share your screen whenever you're ready. Thank you, Debbie. Um, welcome, everyone. I am so honored to be able to be the 16th um, presenter for the Creedon Lecture. This is uh, just a real, real treat for me. Um, I'm speaking to you from my, from my den at home, and which I'm guessing many of the rest of you are in similar locations. I hope you're all staying well and safe. And um, as Debbie said, please do uh, enter your questions in the chat box. I'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. And if we need to follow up later, I'm happy to do that. So the topic for today is loneliness and social isolation among older adults. How can we as professionals and family members and friends, um, but primarily professionals, how can we support the um, you know, the older adult population. And I think it's particularly important right now. And we had chosen this topic long before we knew uh, that we were all going to be um, sheltering in place. And I think that, that it's particularly an important issue for us to be addressing. And I, I hope you will find the topic interesting and meaningful. And, and I will make some comments throughout about uh, how we might particularly do this during, during this period. The work that we do at the Gateway Geriatric Education Center at St. Louis University is supported by funding from uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is part of HHS. So what I want to, to cover today um, is really just to talk generally about loneliness and social isolation and kind of provide you with some prevalence, um, some risk factors, uh, outcomes, that kind of thing. Talk about assessing how to incorporate that into practice, whatever your discipline may be. And then as I mentioned, I want to also talk about some specific things we um, can be doing right now, but also I want you to be thinking about how you carry on some of the strategies that are happening now. How do you carry those on post pandemic period? All right, so as promised, I want to, to talk about uh, prevalence issues. So the important thing to um, talk about first, I think, is the fact that loneliness and social isolation, while these terms get used interchangeably all the time, including by researchers, they are two really very distinctly different things. Um, as you can see here on the slide, uh, loneliness really is a, a subjective uh, perception by the individual of the meaningfulness of the relationships that they have. And it, it comes from us as humans wanting to have um, these satisfying human relationships and then feeling somehow that, that it's not meeting our expectations. While well, social isolation, on the other hand, is um, not entirely, but more of a quantitative kind of, of assessment. It, it actually is the amount of contact or engagement that you have with, with other humans. Um, and as we're learning during this period of our, of our new normal, um, we don't necessarily always have to be engaged in, a, in an in-person kind of way. So just do keep that in mind that, you know, one can be lonely 
and not socially isolated, and you can be socially isolated and not lonely necessarily. So what do we know about loneliness? Um, the term started appearing in the scholarly literature um, back in the 60s, but to be honest, wasn't getting a lot of attention. Um, there are not a lot of research studies that date back that far. Those really have only started to emerge in, in recent years in a, in a significant kind of way. Um, Murthy, a former US Surgeon General, in just three years ago, uh, declared that loneliness really had reached um, global epidemic portions. And I think that that, particularly here in this country, I think really got, got attention and has, has been able to, to, to spur on um, more awareness, more education, and more research. So it's more prevalent than ever um, in at least documented history uh, among all age groups. Our average network size is, is going down, as you can see here. Uh, Cigna, the insurance company, did a very large study, 20,000 US adults, uh, that was published in 2018. And I, I found these numbers staggering. Um, and I think it really cries uh, for attention on, on the part of, of professionals like all of us. So about half of people uh, either sometimes or always feel lonely, uh, feel left out, or find that their relationships are not meaningful. Um, almost a third of people say that they don't feel like they're being understood, they don't feel like they're close to other people, uh, that's a, a slightly smaller number, um, and only 50 53%, which means almost that many in reverse, um, say that they have meaningful daily in-person in -person interactions with other people. Not surprisingly, people who live with others tend to feel less lonely, but single parents do tend to feel more lonely. Um, and I think we can, can probably understand uh, that to some extent. Um, this, this final bullet point, I think, has, has it's probably been pretty shocking um, to most people that um, 18 to 22 year olds and um, heavy social media users tend to report being um, the most lonely. Um, so I think these are all things that we should be paying attention to in all age groups, but obviously we're, we're focused here today on older adults. So to that point, what do we know about uh, loneliness in older adults? The prevalence over the place. 17 to 57 percent is it's a big range. And we, you know, we we're seeing those kind of because those kind of numbers because um, there's there's never been a population wide study, at least that I I'm aware of. And there's it depends on who you ask and when you ask and, and that kind of thing. So I think as 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 this area of study continues to evolve, I think we will see a, a probably a more consistent number. Um, that's in the U.S. There are some, some more narrow focused uh, percentages in, in other countries. But we do see higher rates of loneliness in people who have physical uh, and mental health concerns, but particularly um, think, I, kinds of conditions that isolate people or that make people tend not to engage with others as much. We know absolutely, and this probably goes across the world, that we underassess. I mean, think about your own experience. How often, have, if ever, have, have you been at your primary care provider's office or uh, any, any professional where they've said, how, how are you feeling? Do you feel lonely? How, how much contact and social support do you have? I'm not aware that anyone routinely asks that. So um, the some of the statistics here under the bullet point that says common in older adults came from um, some of the early researchers in this area who are actually, and I'll talk more about them later, who are in Finland. Um, and they've done some pretty extensive studies for about 20 years now in, in Finland. So some of these numbers are coming from there. So they say that seven, and still big ranges, um, but about a third of older adults uh, report experiencing loneliness with 5% uh, feeling like it's often or always. And about a third of nursing home residents and those that live in assisted living facilities also report feeling lonely. Now, these folks probably are not socially isolated because they're having contact, but they can still feel very lonely. Um, we, and I'll 
get into this a little bit in the next slide, uh, but we know that loneliness in older adults has some significant um, negative outcomes related to it. And certainly depression, not surprisingly, is, is uh, linked to loneliness. So <laughs> social isolation, to, to make a distinction there, there's less research specifically on the issue of social isolation, in part, I think, because the two get linked together um, and are used interchangeably, as I've mentioned. Um, but also, it's just not an area that's been as well studied. What studies are out there, um, most, by the way, are not from the US. Um, They're from Europe, primarily. Uh, these have been, um, social isolation has been linked to an increased risk for dementia. Um, we know that socially isolated older adults from the work that's been done uh, are likely um, more so than their, than their counterparts to experience daily stress, have uh, fewer resources, and often have impaired sleep. So risk factors, and that's a, a big part of what we need to be thinking about as we're considering interacting with, with our patients, our clients, our family members. Uh, being married, unmarried, sorry, being unmarried and male, um, and having lower education and income. When I talk more about the, the negative outcomes related to loneliness and social isolation, I think um, you'll, you'll quickly equate that into what is this, you know, what are the financial costs of that? And as you can see from the last bullet point here, um, it costs Medicare about $7 billion a year uh, because we know that people um, who are lonely and sometimes socially isolated will, will they go to the to their physician's offices more. They reach out to the healthcare system in part as a way to be connected to people when possibly they don't have an actual medical need to do that, um, that, that would be different than being lonely or socially isolated. So what are the predictors? Uh, we know, based again on the research, some in the U.S., primarily um, outside the U.S., that has, has been done living in a rural area where uh, your, your children, grandchildren may have left the area um, or others migrate for a variety of reasons. We know people that ha are already predisposed because they have poor functional status, which can include cognitive impairment, being unmarried, uh, being female. And the, the, the speculation about being female is, um, stereotypical as this is, that females have uh, an increased need for connection to, to other people, more so than males. Uh, lower income and education, as I mentioned previously. And then losses, um, just a significant number of losses that, that people can experience by the time they reach, reach um, you know, 65 and older. These three items, depression, living alone, and poorly understood by others, you can see are, are bolded and um, in a different color. And the reason for that is these are the strongest predictors of someone being lonely, a pre-existing depression and living alone again, and then this, this sense of I'm not being understood by other people. And here is the lengthy and somewhat frightening list, I think, of those things that can occur as a result of mostly longer term kinds of loneliness and social isolation. But I suspect that uh, when, when our sheltering in place restrictions are, are lifted and we start to get back to life as, mostly as we knew it before, uh, I suspect we're going to see some emergence of, of these issues in a more short-term kind of situation. So quality of life, I think we can probably all attest to the fact right now, and, and mo many of these things will apply across the age spectrum, but um, I'm, the research I'm citing here is, is done specifically on older adults. So impaired quality of life, impaired cognition, a poorer perception of one's own health, uh, stress, depression. So uh, depression can actually be sort of a cause and effect. Um, you can, depression can cause loneliness and social isolation, but it can also be a result of it. Disabilities, uh, I've already mentioned the increased use of healthcare. Um, the one study that was done uh, looked at a 50% increase in emer the need for emergency services and increased visits to the primary care provider. Uh, increased mortality, uh, 
institutionalization that potentially could have been prevented or at least delayed. And then the long-term effects, which is considered to be more than four years. Um, you can see the list here, hypertension, depression, weight gain, smoking, alcohol, drug abuse, alone time, uh, and then certainly decreased physical activity, coronary disease, sleep issues, cardiac disease. Um, the, uh, I've seen this, uh, this analogy drawn numerous times uh, by, by researchers and, and others that have been studying this area, that uh, chronic long-term loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 packs of cigarettes a day uh, on, the, on the human body. So um, one of the, the researchers that I, I found um, the work to be particularly um, significant is Holt Lundstad. And, and the question is posed, is it loneliness specifically, or is it people becoming more socially disconnected? Interesting question. Um, I think that we need, we need to study. Um, and Holt Lundstad and colleagues actually did a study in 15 of over 3.4 million people that they followed over a period of seven years. And these were people who had reported that they felt lonely. And so what we what they saw as part of that was that 32% of those, um, what those were, I'm sorry, let me back up and say that again. Um, they lived alone indicate an increased risk for death. So 32% of those people were living alone, 29% socially isolated, 26%. So you can see from the, from the graphic here that, you know, loneliness begins to inflame the brain's white blood cells. Uh, that leads to significant and negative mood changes. Uh, the brain begins to then misread those social signals that are being received. Uh, other people become a threat to the individual. And the reality of the way the world is versus their perception of it becomes distorted. So I, I think we've probably most of us, had, even those of us who've worked with older adults, you know, our, our career, throughout our careers, probably have not had a real opportunity to think about the impact of loneliness. Interestingly, however, uh, loneliness does tend to get overestimated among older adults by other age groups. Older adults usually are pretty good at estimating loneliness and self-assessing, but older, other age groups tend to think that more of us are lonely than, than we actually are. So talk about assessment here for a minute. Um, in, in the ideal world, um, we would have comprehensive assessments uh, for social isolation and loneliness. Uh, that's not probably realistic for most people in practice settings. So what I want to do over these next few slides is to really let you know what's out there, how to assess it. There's some tools that are very easy to use. Um, but let me preface all of that by saying, if you don't have time to incorporate new assessment tools into your practice, the best thing you can do is simply ask. Ask someone if they are lonely. Ask how many contacts they have in a given day or week. Um, and I think that it's an important piece to incorporate into your intake process, your history, uh, whatever kind of engagement that you're having with older adults. So there's really um, two kinds of measures. I'm going to talk about gold standards here and, and things that, that we can all aspire to do. Um, so there are two types of measures. One, there's multi-item scales that are not specifically focused on loneliness. So this could be a depression or an anxiety measure, a social support tool. They may not specifically ask the question, are you lonely? But you can certainly get a sense of that. And then there's the single item questions. Like I just said, ask the person if they're lonely. Um, it, it's interesting, if you note here at the bottom, there's sort of a footnote. Uh, women um, seem to be more willing to respond directly uh, to the question when asked, are you lonely? They'll say yes or no. Uh, men, on the other hand, when studied, tend to respond better uh, to, an, to a, a survey kind of a questionnaire. So how can we um, assess this? And, and I think uh, you certainly, hopefully, if you're, if you're um, seeing older adults uh, clinically, I hope that you're in, 
inquiring about depression and anxiety and social support on a, on a regular basis. Um, if you have a patient, for instance, who you seem to uh, see a lot, uh, they seem to come in quite frequently, that might be a good person to really dig a little bit deeper into kind of what's happening in their lives. And I appreciate that, that's, that, you, that in clinical settings, you probably have limited time, but I think it's definitely something that should be prioritized if you're seeing someone who's coming in regularly. Um, you can ask uh, open-ended questions, as I said, um, and be sure that if you do ask about number of contacts, that you do that, put it in the, in the context of a specific amount of time and ask what the contacts are. Are they in person, are they phone, or are they online? Or what combination, but which is, which is the more prevalent? Some sample questions that you can ask um, that may not, if you're not comfortable or you don't think your, your patient or client is going to be comfortable with you asking a sort of more head-on kind of question, you can say, just tell me about your life. Um, how do you spend a typical day? Um, and if, if you have an ongoing long-term relationship, hopefully over time you've gotten to learn about the about the person, you can learn about whether or not they've had losses, or have there been um, significant changes, both health, mental health, or, or in their world. Um, and sometimes you can just say, as I've mentioned, are you lonely? Um, and find out what kind of interests that people have. Think about what sort of questions, one that you're already asking of, of your older patients and clients, but what other kinds of questions would, would fit and work for, for the, um, for the setting and, and the, the service that, that you're providing. These are the, um, as I said, the gold standard of comprehensive assessment if you have the luxury of being able to do that. And I'm going to go over each one of these, but you can just see from this slide, um, cognition, absolutely need to assess that, uh, mood in the form of depression or anxiety, social support, loneliness, and then mobility. So I'll briefly go over all of these uh, because I am more than happy to uh, have a, a, a contact after this lecture today. If you have other questions, my email is at the end of, of the presentation. You can email me, happy to share any information uh, or direct you to where you could get more information on any of these. But I'll, I won't spend a lot of time uh, talking about each of the measures. So the rapid cognitive screen um, is the shortened validated version of the St. Louis University mental status exam that some of you may be familiar with. Um, both the um, St. Louis University mental status exam and the rapid cognitive screen uh, have been validated on multiple continents. Uh, and it's important to know that neither of these tools is, um, oops, sorry, um, neither of these tools are uh, copyrighted so that you can use them freely. Uh, what is supposed to appear here, which for some reason is not, is actually a copy of the rapid cognitive screen. It's not showing up on my screen. I, maybe it is on, on yours, uh, but it's a, it's a four item uh, assessment tool and the scores, if you have the in front of you, you would see that zero to five suggests dementia, a score of six to seven out of 10 is mild cognitive impairment, and then normal cognition would be a score of eight to 10. So um, depression, uh, we recommend the PH2Q, uh, widely, widely known, and is uh, open for, for public use. Do not need to get permission for any reason to use that. It's a two item screening tool. Um, and if the person tests positive for depression, this, the recommendation then is that you go on uh, uh, to complete the PHQ-9. Uh, and again, on my screen that I'm looking at right now, the copy that I uh, co copy and pasted onto this slide is not showing, uh, but the PHQ-9 is just a more in-depth version of, of the PHQ-2 uh, and can really give you a much better sense. And you can see the scoring here. I'm happy to send those copies of those if, if people would like them. So also important to assess anxiety. And anxiety manifests itself very differently in people um, and can certainly have an onset at any point in our lives. So, um, and often gets tied up into depressive 
symptoms as well. So I think it's, it's worthwhile to consider if you have the opportunity to do a more extensive assessment of the older adult around this issue um, that, that you do assess. And the generalized anxiety scale is, is a well-known um, scale that is fairly quick and can be administered. You can see the scoring right here. And um, I let me go on. The Lubin Social Support Scale, also not showing up on my screen, um, is a shortened version of the original Lubin Social Support Scale and um, asks two sets of questions. Um, it asks questions about contact and support from family and contact and support from friends. So um, it's uh, a, a tool that kind of helps you just to get a picture and then the score of 12 or lower delineates at risk for social isolation. The UCLA loneliness scale, the revised version, um, is the one that uh, should be showing here, um, is probably the best known and most widely used loneliness scale. Um, it has been around for a, a considerable amount of time and is well validated. Um, has been validated on both a younger adult population as well as older adults specifically. And it's still a little bit lengthy. Um, it's, it's almost 20 questions and I think, you know, may not lend itself particularly well to use in a, in a fast-paced clinical setting. The Alone Scale is a brand new, uh, as yet unvalidated uh, tool that uh, is, as you can see here, five items. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. John Morley, um, here at St. Louis University, developed this scale as part of our current Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program grant, and uh, in which one of our initiatives actually is to, um, to uh, develop interventions to address loneliness and social isolation. And uh, Dr. Morley created this um, mnemonic alone um, with five items. Uh, are you attractive to others as a friend? Not physically, are you attractive? Are you lonely? Uh, are you outgoing and friendly? Do you feel you have no friends? And are you emotionally upset or sad? Um, as I said, we, we have not yet validated it. It's a brand new tool, happy to have people use it and um, would, would be fascinated to, to receive your feedback about how, how it's uh, a, easy or not to administer, and are you finding it a helpful tool? We do have plans to, to validate it. The SARC-F um, is uh, a, a, another item, which I'm, it's not showing on my screen here, but again, I'm hoping it may be on yours. Uh, the SARC-F uh, assesses muscle weakness. And the reason that a physical uh, assessment is necessary is we know that as people uh, develop muscle weakness, which we all do, it's a normal part of aging, uh, that our, our abilities do decline uh, regardless of, of uh, our exercise uh, regimens, that we, we do experience that uh, muscle loss over, over the decades. We also know that as people um, become uh, possibly into the frail area uh, or even pre-frail, we know people tend to, to become less active in some cases, and that can lead not only to loneliness, but social isolation as well. If, if, it's, if, it's, if they're concerned about falls, if walking has become challenging, uh, if they're just not feeling physically as, as well as they had been, they may tend to kind of close in a bit and, and tend to stay home more often. Okay. Interventions, what can we do? Um, and I want to preface this section, uh, which really is kind of the, the remaining, remaining part of, of the presentation here, um, by saying one size does not fit all. Uh, loneliness and social isolation are experienced uniquely by all of us. My, my loneliness may not look like yours. And the loneliness of someone uh, living in a residential facility may look uh, similar, or may look different to someone living in the community. So I think keep that in mind. Um, but also as we're going through this, these next slides, I, I encourage you to think about what kind of things are available as resources in the communities that you live in, uh, what could be available, maybe what, what kind of things um, are, are happening now during the pandemic, and what might we do in the future? Um, 
I'm, I'm of the belief that, that we were concerned about loneliness and social isolation before the pandemic. And I think there's a lot of good lessons that we can learn as we go um, into to the post-pandemic period. And we can take some of the strategies that we've, we've thought about and, and learned about. Okay, so how can we address this? Well, the first thing we need to do is what we're doing right here today. We need to increase education for professionals. Uh, I be interesting to know how many of you ever had either of these issues addressed in your training uh, or in continuing education, professional development kinds of activities. So we need to make sure that we're educating ourselves about what are these things, the distinctions that I talked about, and to be on the lookout for them because we now are familiar with the risk factors and the, the potential outcomes. So uh, we need to be Assessing, 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 as I've said, and be more sensitive to the issues. Um, I'll talk more about this in, in, a, in a few slides, but their loneliness and social isolation are incredibly complex issues. Uh, they don't pop up overnight. Um, they are often years in the making. Uh, they, as, as, as we've learned from the risk factors and, and the implications that I talked about, they um, affect many, many different aspects of our lives. And so because they're complex and they're multifaceted, we need a multi-system approach. Um, just, you know, making a note to yourself to call your mother um, or your grandmother uh, once a week, that's great. I wouldn't discourage you from doing that. But I think that's, if, if the, your mother or grandmother is lonely or social, socially isolated, that one contact a week probably is not going to be enough. So we need to be thinking bigger about this. Group interventions are the things, um, are the, the types of strategies that have primarily been used. Um, they don't necessarily uh, need to be the only ones that we use. And I think, um, again, this pandemic is is reminding well not reminding us in some cases letting us know for the first time that there are other ways to stay connected we don't need to just have everybody come um, and sit in a circle and have a group intervention so um, we need to have different kinds of intervention and that's what i'm going to to share with you over the the next um, few slides. Uh, but again, be thinking about what's out there in my community, what's, what could be out there in my community, because it, it certainly many of you on, the, on this uh, webinar today could, could absolutely be the initiators of something. Uh, there is evidence out there, uh, fairly recent as well, that suggests that um, having a formalized intervention works. Uh, it, it addresses the issue of service utilization, in some ways not only uh, decreasing service utilization that may not be absolutely required, but also increasing utilization of other resources. Um, we know that we can accurately measure social isolation. Uh, we know that we can evaluate these, these interventions to determine whether or not they're really truly effective. Um, we know that no matter what intervention, uh, whether it's individual or group, we do have to respect the right of the, of the individual to participate. Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, uh, the role of technology, not unsurprisingly, uh, particularly where we are right now, uh, the role of technology has, has had been on the, the increase before uh, COVID-19, but it has shot through the roof exponentially um, since, since the beginning of this, as we all know, as evidenced by the fact that I'm speaking to you from my, from my den. Okay, so as providers and professionals, what can we do? Um, we need to make sure that we're treating any of those, uh, those issues that I talked about uh, earlier that put someone at risk or that are linked to to loneliness and social isolation. Anything that will limit someone from being uh, independent and, and being able and willing to engage in, in meaningful connections with other people. So chronic illnesses, sensory impairments. Think about that older adult who has uh, a hearing impairment. Um, so they tend to stop going places that are crowded. 
and because they can't hear, they can't just make the distinctions of sound. Uh, so they become more social, socially isolated. Um, malnutrition, incontinence, foot health. I mean, there's a, a, a an probably endless list of things that that prevent people from from going out and connecting with other people. Um, again, to reemphasize the connections between depression and cognition. Uh, again, those are things that will turn people more inward. So how, how can we make sure that we're, we're addressing these issues in, in this more global kind of way? So um, a comprehensive geriatric assessment, not just one for loneliness and social isolation, but a comprehensive geriatric assessment by an interprofessional team or a geriatrician uh, can, can uncover all kinds of things that may not be able, oftentimes due to, to limitations of time, be able to be uh, picked up by a primary care provider. So um, we know that if someone goes through a comprehensive geriatric assessment with appropriate follow-up, that uh, we can uh, increase by 25% the likelihood that this person will still be able to be living in their own home after the assessment and follow-up intervention. Regularly monitoring the, the person's needs. Uh, asking what they need, checking in. It's yes, you can, uh, you know, on a new patient or new client intake, you can certainly ask about loneliness and social isolation, but you need to keep asking because people's lives change. Um, they experience losses, they experience health issues. You need to keep asking the question at every visit uh, or every contact that you have. Uh, making sure that, that you are openly communicating and thinking about ways to support the older adult and in, in the cases where there's a caregiver to make sure that the caregiver is, is engaged in the process. Um, interestingly, some of the research shows that people who live with a caregiver or have a caregiver still de describe themselves as being lonely. Maybe not socially isolated, but lonely. Um, making sure you get that caregiver engaged in the process. And social prescribing is a, is a term I think that, that originates in the UK, uh, but it simply refers to making appropriate referrals. So that requires that you know your referrals, uh, know your resources in the communities that you can refer to. Or as, as I teach social work students, sometimes you have to create those resources. I share this um, kind of busy looking uh, graphic um, that comes from, um, from Australia, I believe, uh, is where the senior Victorians is. Uh, and it, it just, I, I share it because as I've said, loneliness and social isolation, uh, they're complex issues. And because of that, as I mentioned, we need a multifaceted approach. We need to be coordinated. We need to be communicating. We need to value older adults. And hopefully I'm speaking to an audience today that, that is already um, in a situation where you, you do value um, older adults. Not everyone, I, I don't think, does. So I think that we, we have to make sure that we're all on the same team. We need to make sure that we've got older adults providing input into the strategies and the interventions that get developed to be able to um, address both of these issues. We need to make sure we have adequate referrals uh, out there, that there are resources that can actually support this. Education, education, education on this issue. Um, and then we get to, to the one issue that oftentimes is a deal breaker, and that's personal mobility and local transportation. Um, you know, we've got, oftentimes we come up with wonderful plans, we have ideas for groups, we've mobilized things, we can offer a, a group intervention, and if we can't get people there, physically can't get people there, then we, we can't, you know, be as helpful and effective. Now, one of the things that this current situation that we're all in is teaching us is you don't necessarily have to have in-person groups. So I'll talk about that um, momentarily. So the research um, that's been done on the interventions, um, the, the early work, as you can see here, Anderson um, published in, in 85, showed promising results but oftentimes the dropout rates were really high. And, and I think when you have a group of older adults 
well, this applies to any any group intervention, but older adults in particular, um, you know, I think you're, you, you run the risk of uh, having fairly high dropout rates simply because health issues, transportation issues um, get, in, get into the mix. And so uh, if, to the extent you can to address those. Um, part of the, the other reason that the earlier work uh, was promising but not, you know, ideal was that it, that the interventions did not include health related information. Um, so the conclusion um, today in 2020 is that an effective intervention to address loneliness and social isolation would include uh, some kind of physical activity or exercise health related information, something to stimulate the brain. Um, and uh, that can come in many different forms. And that you, if you have a group intervention, that you have facilitators who understand group dynamics. Uh, they hopefully have had some group experiences. They understand the concept of empowering people for change. Um, they are very focused, very, so the, it's person-centered, client-centered kind of interventions, and that they promote interaction. So those, those are all the ideals that we, would, that we should strive for. So Jansen, and this is one of the researchers from Finland that I'll talk more about as, as I get to one of the specific interventions, um, just, just recently published something um, that I thought was, was, would be particularly of interest to, to you all as you're thinking about what, uh, you know, what, what is a group intervention supposed to look like? And I think that uh, this first bullet point, interview participants before the group to determine fit, comes back to the point that I made about not, it's not one size fits all. Uh, our uh, folks who out there who have no interest in being part of a group. And uh, you can offer it, you can make it available, hoax a little bit possibly, but ultimately it's, it's the person's right to determine for themselves. So that's why we need to have a, a, a variety of different options to, to offer people. Um, we need to know what people expect. Um, we, we ha I'll, I'll share with you some of the work we're doing here in St. Louis, but we, we had one group of people who came thinking um, that the group, they'd been advertised, they came, they thought it was going to talk, be to talk about their landlord. Uh, they all lived in a similar place. And um, it, it wasn't, it was, it was a group to address loneliness and social isolation. So after that, ex after the purpose of the group was, was clarified in that first session, the numbers dropped off uh, after, after that. So you need to make sure that you know what people are looking for when you invite them to participate in a group. Um, you know, a lot, of, a, a lot of the power of a group intervention is the social engagement with other people. So providing plenty of time uh, for connecting, addressing loneliness head on, uh, facilitating meaningful activities, and um, hopefully to help people just feel like they've gained a little bit of control. So I want to talk about four different kind of interventions. Um, I'll go over the first three really quickly, um, and then I'll spend a little bit more time on Circle of Friends. Okay, so friendship benches, uh, and I don't see any of the pictures that I had. I have beautiful pictures here of benches uh, and people on them. So this is a concept that, that uh, really has, is not at all widespread in, uh, here in the U.S. This is much more uh, in Europe and to a lesser extent in Africa. So these, they, they place these benches outside of primary care offices, and they're staffed by lay uh, health workers, otherwise known as the grandmother health providers. And these you can come, you can just sit and chat with the person, uh, come up to six times. And the research that's been done, uh, this, this research is cited is, is from Africa, where it shows decreased um, depression scores, accessibility, support structure, services, and it's, it's a very inexpensive intervention. Chat benches are something that um, has have popped up in the UK. In 2017, um, the, a, a Ministry of Loneliness was created in the UK, and um, many, many activities have, have uh, come out of that uh, initiative, including the chat benches, which were um, placed around uh, various parts of the UK uh, after um, 
by the by the police department for elder abuse awareness day just this past year uh, because they identified that older adults often become socially isolated and are and can become victims of, of crime very easily people just come they sit on the benches and engage with other people um, so it's it's think about the the typical park bench uh, just sit down and there and the picture that I'm not seeing on my screen uh, says please sit here and chat so befriending services um, are are is an umbrella term for uh, both in person and more recently technologically facilitated kinds of connections so a, a befriending service is thought about where a relationship between two or more individuals uh, is made and this can be done by in-person contact phone uh, many of us are familiar with telephone reassurance programs uh, that, that uh, area agencies on aging have done in the past uh, or, or currently and uh, or church groups might do it. But these uh, are shown just to, to, one, it's a safety check as much as anything, but it also provides an outside connection on a daily basis for, for the individual. Technology has uh, shown a significant uh, and creative, innovative way to stay connected to people. So we have voice activated smart speakers uh, that help people. We have the virtual care assistant to remind people uh, when it's time to take medications and oh, it's now it's time to call your daughter. Uh, there's uh, some new things that I just read about this week, in fact, um, interactive photo sharing where uh, you have a, a, a technological device that you, uh, you press on a, a picture that's been preloaded to it. You can then send a, a voice or a video message to your family member who, the, who is in the picture, and then they can send something back. Uh, there are websites being developed now that match older adults. So, uh, Someone who is living alone um, may find it difficult to cook for themselves. Uh, people can sign up to cook and drop off food. Uh, the runners that's mentioned here, the runners um, are, it's a website that pairs up literally runners who run by the individual's house, check in on them, maybe do some tasks, some chores around the house. So I think, you know, it, you're limited only by your creativity. Uh, in terms of, of how we can stay connected. Co-living arrangements uh, are those uh, that are intentional communities, uh, people who are uh, both uh, older adults who come together to live. Think about the Golden Girls TV show from the 90s. Or these can be, for instance, younger adults who are in need of housing uh, can live with older adults in exchange for help and support. Uh, these, a lot of this happens informally, but there are organizations now that are formalizing this process. So co-housing options is a sort of form of co-living. Uh, these are typically groups of older adults who come together. Uh, it may be a resident-owned kind of um, a housing complex or individual home. Uh, there's just, that gets cost prohibitive uh, because not everyone has the, the uh, you know, resources to be able to buy in to a resident-owned kind of co-housing situation. So a few around the U.S. now are, are starting to be available to people who are renting. Lots of benefits, social interaction, friendship, support, growth, and development. There are barriers, and meaning it's not for everyone. Time commitment, it's self-governed in most cases, so everybody has to participate in, in setting policies and essentially almost policing one another. Uh, it can also be expensive. Um, so circle of friends uh, is the one I wanted to spend just a few minutes here on. Uh, this was developed by the group in Finland that I've made reference to. It's a group intervention meets eight. Uh, it's a group of eight, sorry, that meets 12 times over the course of three months uh, with the sole purpose of getting people connected to one another, uh, decreasing loneliness and increasing uh, social connection to others. The idea behind Circle of Friends is it started off by a facilitator and then the group continues on. So lots of good evidence. The, the Finnish group who've been very um, generous with us in terms of, of uh, providing us with information to be able to offer this group in, uh, in, in the US. Um, they've, they've been at this for about 20 years now. They have a very low dropout rate. Um, they don't have a high rate of, of groups being um, continued on afterwards, about 40%. But 95% of people uh, reported at the end of their experience that they no longer felt lonely. 
So why does it work? Um, it works because the activities, those meaningful activities uh, that the older adult engages in are determined by the group themselves. It's not heavy facilitator initiated. Uh, we know that social support impacts the neuroendocrine system uh, and people feel empowered, they feel stimulated. Every session includes uh, three components, art and inspiring activities, a group exercise or a health theme discussion, could be outside speakers. Uh, in both of these cases, uh, it could be something that the group engages in. And then the, the third, and in some ways, maybe the most significant uh, piece is that they engage in writing, if that's uh, feasible for the group, uh, but then sharing and reflecting about how, how they feel about loneliness and the past and their lives. Um, so who's appropriate for such an intervention like this? An older adult who reports feeling lonely, uh, willing to participate, uh, does not have sensory impairments that would prohibit them from active engagement. Um, and they, there can be mild cognitive impairment, uh, but not moderate or severe. They, they, the person will be most benefited if they're able to, to engage. So. During the COVID-19 pandemic, what can older adults do uh, to offset loneliness or at least not worsen it if they already possibly felt that way? And I think that's the group that's, that's at greatest risk. They need to stay connected in whatever way possible. Um, you know, there are older adults who, who are not engaged in, um, you know, technology to speak of. Um, and this is a time maybe that they can begin to, to learn the basics. You don't have to be tech savvy. Maintaining a, their daily routine as much as possible, focusing on healthy eating, exercise, sleep, uh, pay attention to their own needs and feelings, have a plan, uh, including making sure you have an advanced directive in the event that you'd become ill, staying active, uh, engaged in activities that are, are meaningful, relaxing. There are ways to volunteer and not leave your house. Um, you can certainly reach out to others through a buddy system. And last but absolutely not least, and this applies to all of us, consider a news diet where you limit your access because there's so much information out there, it can really become overwhelming. So if we know people that are living in residential care, and I just, an hour before we started um, this, this presentation, I just saw something come out from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that said there um, are cases now in uh, 49 nursing homes in the state of Missouri. So we know it's, it's spreading into the residential community. Um, you know, what can we do to support the adults and the staff? Uh, and that is, you know, follow the protocols, uh, try to stay connected. I know I have colleagues that are out in, in residential care. They're, they've done some incredibly creative things around video conferencing and uh, virtual movies and, and virtual tours that they're doing. Uh, maintaining the daily uh, routine again is, is critically important. Um, organizing groups to, to write cards, of course sent electronically, um, that can be, can be inspiring. Um, making sure that people are uh, connected to family and friends, but also making sure that this, you know, supporting the staff in reaching out to family and friends. And live streaming activities. There's lots of, lots of things that can be done now. It just requires, I think, for us to think outside of the box of usual um, activities that happen in, in the residential care. So what can we do to support caregivers? Uh, caregiving can be an isolating and lonely uh, endeavor to begin with. And I think that we can support them by staying in touch, uh, making sure that they know to provide extra reminders about reminding the person with, particularly if they have dementia, that they are, um, you know, we need to wash our hands more often. We need, that's why we, we're staying home. Home, prepare, prepare for closures, changes, illness, staying connected, knowing the resources, uh, and again, engaging in, in self-care. Last, uh, what can we do for ourselves? We can reach out to our patients and their caregivers and our coworkers and our family and friends. We can um, be sending information to our patients and clients and the caregivers on uh, cognitive activities, exercise. Uh, we can be asking them on a regular basis what we can do to help and we need to take care of ourselves and we need to stay even though don't overload yourself, but do stay current with the resources uh, without being overwhelmed. And make sure that you're getting your information from reliable sources. 
Okay, I've got lots of pages here of resources. I am going to fly through these because I know you'll have that, this presentation if you want. Um, take home messages. There's significant issues before the pandemic. We need to be thinking very seriously more so now. Uh, we need to assess. And there are interventions that are evidence-based that are, are worthy of our attention. Uh, we were going to provide uh, a workshop and training on Circle of Friends at our Summer Institute that is being postponed until fall for obvious reasons. Stay tuned uh, on that one. And Debbie has asked uh, me to, to mention the evaluation. She put a link to that in the chat box. And with that, I am, I am finished. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bergwager. Really appreciate it. I'm um, going to give you a round of applause here um, with my um, my fancy little reaction button. That's so awesome. Um, uh, if, are there any questions? I wonder if Dr. Bergwager, if you would mind going back to the slide where people can see the QR code and the link to the okay. survey. Sure. You'll have to share your screen. Sorry. Yeah. I un un. Uh... Um, right there. Yeah. And I'm getting ready to post that link again in the chat box. Um, there we go. Any questions? Oh, the QR code didn't show up. No, I, I don't know. Something happened in the transition because I'm not seeing it on, on mine either. And all my lovely pictures um, <laughs> that I wanted to share with you that I'm not seeing them on my screen, as I mentioned throughout. So I'm not sure what, right. what went awry there. Yeah. Um, I don't have, um, so far I don't have any questions that have okay. popped up, um, but we can take a few minutes. Um, Looks like we have three minutes left if anyone yeah. has, has any questions. Right. I just think that we, this, the, while we're waiting to see if anyone has questions, I, I think we can, once the crisis of the COVID-19 um, situation has, has at least abated somewhat uh, and we're starting to get back, I think it, it's, it, it's, we should all make sure that we take time and think about what have we learned from this. Um, I just actually wrote an editorial yesterday for a for a, a geriatric journal on on what can what can we be thinking about. First of all, you know, people who were at risk for loneliness and social isolation probably have had exacerbations of that during this period, and I think that uh, you know we we need to be particularly um, sensitive to those people and their needs and what can we do. What technology have we put in place and employed that we can then continue on? And um, what can we learn from that? How, you know, it has the potential to, to radically change our practice approach. We can be doing a lot more things via telehealth. We're working, uh, Dr. Morley is, and I are working right now with a, a, a company on developing a telehealth delivery platform to be able to offer Circle of Friends and another intervention we do, cognitive stimulation therapy, um, via telehealth. And you know, we were actually exploring that before. We just really stepped up the, the time. I see that somebody says that when you download the slides, all the missing pictures are available. Yay. Oh, good. Good. Um, something about the, the way it, it presented on the screen, they just disappeared. So uh, thank you, Randy, for sharing that. Um, but I think, I think we can. I think we're going to hopefully be much more aware. I think people are going to ask the questions more often about how people are feeling and are they lonely and socially isolated. So anything else, Debbie, that, that I should address? No, I don't. Um, I don't think so. Lots okay. of comments, lots of thank yous. Um, it says um, Tabitha has a question. Have you seen oh. studies to, or outreach um, that looks at it um, at issues related to patients with hearing loss and social isolation because these can go on hand in hand? I have not, but I. It's not to say that it's not out there. I just have not in all of my reading um, and and you know, studying of this, this issue, I have not run across anything. I, I would agree with you that that and social isolation absolutely go hand in hand. That would make a great study. 
and um, it may be out there. And actually, I've got a my my graduate assistant is is uh, doing a, a more extensive lit search than what I've already done to date, and I will have her put that in specifically. So thank you, Tabitha, for that for that question. All right, All right. my clock says one o'clock. Um, and I thank you again. I really appreciate everyone uh, being, being here and um, stay safe and, and well. Thanks, Dr. Bergweger. Really appreciate it. Thank you.